We get asked a lot about Bud Light. How did they botch it so bad? And what's the path back? To be honest with you, I don't think there is one. We're going to discuss that and how wokeness, or whatever you want to call it, has creeped into marketing. All that and more today on the Marketing Mad Men podcast. They say marketing is a madman's game. So now we turn it over to the Marketing Mad Men with Nick Constantino and Trip Job. Happy Saturday. Welcome to the Marketing Mad Men. Trip Job and Nick Constantino here, uh, live from the battery. And uh, what do you know? We've got the man. We've got Los, Carlos Medina from um, the Morning Extra joining us today. So it's going to be fun. Yeah. So we, this is one we can get reverent and angry about, too, which makes it even that much more fun to have him. So uh, we found out. Wait yesterday. a minute. I'm, I'm angry? Is that what we're going uh, with? <laughs> this is one that I want you to get angry and oh, irreverent about because okay, it's yes. so stupid it's so that, close I, that to I think heart. anger and irreverence is the only way See, to treat this when thing. you guys promote this program and you talk about the stuff you get into and y'all talk about the number of episodes and the, the people you have on, I find myself going, okay, let me see what like the, the angle is going to be. Uh, so when you start off, because you've had a lot of smart people uh, join y'all, when you start off by saying, ah, angry, I'm like, okay, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> and the, I'm not an angry person, typically. We, we spend most of our time talking about good marketing principles, sure. but there are times that come up where it is just so stupid and is handled so poorly well, that anger and irrever- is the only way to handle but, it. But see, marketing is sometimes about emotion. So in this case, we do have angry. But uh, we, also have the, we also have the numbers behind you, which is what I appreciate personally about Lowe's so yeah. much is that it's not no. just the what's on the surface because people stop there. It's the numbers that go behind it, which I think paint a picture if you want that picture to be painted. Well, just yeah. understand this. Just for the, for the audience, if, if you're not aware, uh, you know, obviously I co-host the morning extra that do every weekday morning, 6 to 10, right here on Extra 106.3. But I spent the better part of 20 years in sports talk radio, namely with The Fan, uh, our sister station, and I'm I'm pretty much a data analyst weirdo. It's it's what I come down to. I have have an undergrad in information systems. I have a master's in global business. I have a hard time when I see some of these companies going certain directions – when you know putting on the political hat and saying what are you doing like, yeah, what is right. the, what is the plan here yeah. and i think uh, some of them are over reliant on the data you're talking about and that is part of the problem Ab- i think this is a situation w- where bud light looked at future trends now remember you're talking anheuser you're talking imbev you're talking a company that is brazilian and belgian that is who owns anheuser busch so what whatever you believe in your right. head is lost in what the company is and they were looking at trends data analysts surveys and trying to do something in which data was telling them to do as opposed right. to this is the Clydesdale this is the American Eagle right. they supposed to what they built their brand on so that's the top that's here. the topic today so why are we here why are we losing you know why are brands losing their way oh shit we forgot to right. the topic yeah that's the topic so <laughs> no I think we set it up well and I think I think it is going to be great with having Lois and his background on and um uh, but yeah, the first one we do want to talk about is is Anheuser Busch and yeah. Bud Light and and what's going on now in the aftermath. Um, but that's not the only one. So yeah. we're going to get into a lot of examples today about um, how do you make sure you know a business owner or um, you're working for a larger company. How do you make sure you don't lose your way? And with all the influences out there, and I think that's uh, another yeah. area that I uh, want to dive into Los and because he sees it all the time as these influences, whether it's political or uh, economic, that come in and, and start to you know, steer or shift uh, people's movement and brands. Yeah. And I think two things. One, we need, we should keep the, the politics out of this because it's more than politics. It is, it is race. It is gender. It's anything that is purposely put to divide us. And I think that is an overarching issue is that it's easier. Well, I'm going to get down the rabbit hole. It's easier to control when you divide people. (laughs) When when you, when you divide them into groups, they, the the thought is it's easier to control them. So, so let's, I I think AB is the starting point, but like you said, there's a lot more to go here. Well, when you guys ask about how we got here and so much of it is that we've made uh, partisan politics, we've turned it into entertainment In, in the last 20, 25 years. We now have where we constantly monitor not just, hey, what is uh, Johnny Carson or what's Jay Leno doing on Late Night? But now we go, hey, what's going on on CNN? What's going on on MSNBC? What's going on on Fox? And it's become largely this area where, depending on what trough you want to feed at, I'm going to give it to you and hopefully I'll entertain you in that way. And in my opinion, it's now created this this divide where how I view a company and potentially how they market, I start running it through my political filter and what entertains me. Yeah, and it even gets into, you know, Meta Reels, Instagram. Sure does. YouTube, 
X. Yeah, yeah where, I mean, where am I advertising? Right. What am I advertising? Right. Who am yeah. I using? Right. Yeah. And those things are built to amplify those things. No right. one's going to go on YouTube if it's showing the things they don't want. So it takes whatever your tendency is and whatever you believe it is, and it amplifies those things in any direction. Not one direction. In any direction amplifies those things. So that's another problem you have, right? There's not just old school marketing ways to reach people. Yeah. It's not TV and radio like it used to be. There's a hundred forms to market to people now. So the vir- the virility, the virility <laughs> in which it spreads is 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 much greater than it ever was before. But I, I think there's now the, the questions that we ask. It's who am I trying to reach and what are they wanting to hear? And and those can be completely different things depending yeah. on what I'm using. Yep. You know, when I talk, those can be yeah. different what time of day. What absolutely. Time of year, absolutely. Like I talk to uh, I often tell our interns on the sports side, I would say, show me your advertising, I'll tell you who your audience is, who you're trying to reach. And when we talk about like for the NFL, and that's coming around, we got a couple weeks out that's geared to Ben twenty five fifty four and what are we selling? Medications, trucks, yep. You know, gold, land. I was like, we're trying to do it because they typically are head of household. They're the people watching the NFL. But when I'm trying to reach you through a social media platform, I'm going to give you a totally different message and a totally different product in a totally different way. Yeah, yeah. but that's also because of the, the, if it's a higher dollar item, it's harder to sell that way. Social Absolutely. media right. is yep. quick things that are like, hey, 80% off, buy right now. Oh, I'll buy a pair off. of Nikes for my daughter for yeah. a volleyball tournament because I'll go like, oh, look, message. Here, well, 70 bucks. Top, let's do it. It's bottom of the funnel versus top, top of the funnel. Of the funnel. Sure, but like, yeah. let's, let's get back into this segment and, and yeah. go back. So let's the latest. Yeah. All right? let's, you know, so we all know, obviously, what happened let's several months back. Let's talk about how we got here. But, and let's take but this, with Bud Light, let's start there. And where are we? Let's take this out of the realm of what you're reading. I will right. say this radio station, as of yesterday, got thousands, tens of thousands of dollars removed from the books, meaning the national agency pulled back all of their buys, which is a crime to begin with. Like, don't yeah. place your marketing and take it back because you're breaking the system. Like, you right. cannot just commit to buy something, but whatever. We and and it's not it. just here. I mean, it's we, across we, the country. We, we, let them, we let them do it. So but, we but already, by the way, this is as football season is starting. This right. is their prime time. Insanity. Yeah. Insanity. So that got me thinking, and, it's, and, and I'm curious how we got here. Politically, I get that. But how... Did Bud Light botch this so bad? How did they believe that going from one side to the polar opposite, they violated and broke so much trust right. that their their idea was to go the polar opposite way? Uh, Los, I'm curious, right. why do you think it backfired so bad for them? It backfired so badly for them because, and, and again, with, with not d- jumping wildly into the politics sure. of it, they looked at their audience and said, we've got to change who our audience is. The idea that you were a a working man, frat-oriented beer, and again, one that sells all over the country as number it one. It is mass, mass audience. Yeah, I, I always knew that I could always host a tailgate, host a party. I could always buy Bud Light, and no one would come on in, grab your Bud Light, keep it moving. And that, and that was a very acceptable thing. When they decided to use an influencer that often portrays themselves, he's, he's a man who portrays themselves yep. as a nine-year-old girl, and you did it the wrong time of year. You did it as we went into March Madness. The opening weekend of March Madness, not only is, is it geared towards men, but it's also geared towards it's the biggest time of year for vasectomies. Why? Because men will get a vasectomy, they'll stay at home, and they'll, and they'll watch, watch television. That's what they do. Yep. So you basically, Shoot, that's when I did mine. Yeah, I'm not completely. It, I guess by a perfect, by accident. But, 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 that, yeah. but that is the most. That is the time of year where they happen the most for men. That's when yeah. they do it because they're going to sit at home. Wife's going to look after them. They can watch as much college basketball as they want, and they can get as much marketing as well. <laughs> so think about when you decided, as a beer company that's geared towards working men, dudes at home who just got vasectomies and frat guys, and you advertise to them with a man who's pretending to be a nine-year-old girl saying, "Buy this beer." You yeah. don't know your audience. Yeah, disconnect. The totally disconnect is huge. disconnect. And to think that the the marketing professional who was in charge of this, and I saw the picture of her team and, and her operations team, and it was predominantly women. There was maybe three or four men out of like the 16-person team. And I thought, at no point did someone raise their hand in a meeting and say, do we know who our audience is? Maybe this is a bad yeah. idea. Or, or a bad time. And, uh, okay. Bad time. You might, might be able to hide the or might, might be able to hide. I'm not saying you can, but maybe there's a location. Maybe there's a, an event, time of the year, whatever. But not in the sweet spot, you know. As you said, college basketball season, March Madness, NFL kickoff. You know, there are a couple other huge times of the year. Uh, Daytona 500. I mean, those are the type of things that are right in their sweet spot. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the craziest part of all of this, though, is that people got educated to the fact that Bud Light, it's now Anheuser-Busch. Because most yeah. people don't know that Bud Light, oh, who owns what, right? Yeah. Procter & Gamble has made a living off of it. Should, yeah. Even we do to some extent. We don't need people to know all the time that Extra and 680 are associated just when it's convenient right. for us. But the fact, so one of the problems, look, Bud Light a lo- about, I think it was third, 20, 30 years ago, started making the beer with rice because rice was cheaper and was subsidized in this country. It changed completely at that point. Nobody uprose then. And to be honest with you, I don't like it. I don't like, I taste the rice in the yeah. beer now. I don't like it. 
But when they started, they stopped drinking yeah. Stella Artois. They stopped drinking all the NIs. So you have an educated consumer now that I don't think existed previously. That now all of a sudden they're not revolting against the brand itself, but the company and the management and their other lines, well, which I don't think anyone ever thought the spillover would have been as great and as they it was. Were, they thought they were too big to fail. And I'll go back a year before. All right. You remember the seltzer craze. Everyone had had sure. seltzers. Well, Anheuser-Busch was late to the game. When they finally came to the game, they made it Bud Light Seltzer, which was a huge branding mistake. But they were so big that it really couldn't fail. Now, if it failed in sales. Well, it failed right? because seltzer failed. Because the RTD phase came well, they in. Were, they the, were late. All, but but they all were, the seltzers are, it's but over. But it, it didn't sell, but it didn't hurt Bud Light at that point in time because, again, they thought they were too big to fail, i.e. the marketing team. Yeah. But it really was a colossal mistake to tie seltzer to Bud Light because it went back to, okay, who are your predominant seltzer drinkers? Younger? Yes. More female than male? Mm-hmm. Against what we go back to, what the Bud Light yeah, I don't core think demographic a lot of is in the NFL, also, watching the NFL games, drinking a seltzer. I just don't think yeah, there are many. But remember, the person who's who's opening up that seltzer, a lot of times they're also health, they're health conscious yep. as far as the amount of calories they're consuming. Yep. The random guy on a Sunday, as he gets to his tenth beer, isn't thinking, "Man, I cost myself ten more calories <laughs> on this <laughs> thing than the the comparable beer." He's just having his beer and having a good time. But you brought yeah. up a good point because it's not that many more calories. It's, I mean, it's, it's not yeah. it's not two eighty versus one hundred. It's, yeah, exactly. it's like one hundred eight versus yeah. one twelve. So right. that's another marketing ploy gone wrong is when you believe yeah. that because it's like, you know what light beer is? It's really, I mean, honestly, you could safely say drinking one light beer a day versus drinking one coke a day, the light beer is probably better for you. There are probably uh, some there, there's, people, a, there's some rewards there. But anyway, I look, so they, they botched it. They botched the rebound. But how is this still going? Did this become the tentpole for the, this movement? Talk about that because I think that's an important differ- point of differentiation. Have we just revolted completely against them? And is a reset the right mo- the right thing to do right now? Well, for me, I think that when it came to the a little bit of the political end, you had a people that realized, wait a minute, I don't want to have things marketed to me in this way when it when it goes against who I am. The the frat guy, the dude who worked his twelve hour day and picked up a six pack on the way home. He looked at it and said, this is the only way that I can tell these people, don't do this to me, don't market this way to me. And so there was an empowerment when it started to happen. Yeah. You started to see the market share fall off the way it did because typically you you don't really have an organized boycott. That's not what it is. Yeah. People just said, there's a viable option. I'm going to do another option. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think that's a great point. And when we come back from the break, I want to dive a little bit more into that about – Market to me, don't market to me, and how your choices are and why we saw that. Yeah. So uh, you're listening to the Marketing Man Men on Extra 106.3. We'll be right back. Tonight in Arkansas, there's a mother tucking in her daughter and turning off the light. A business owner is burning the midnight oil. An at-home dinner date is plating up possibility. And it's all happening under one roof. How? The power of a conversation, like the one John from Integrity Solutions had with First Horizon Bank about his vision for a sustainable mixed-use building. Now it's not just words, it's life. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Now back to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3 FM. Welcome back to the Marketing Mad Men. Trip Job and Nick Constantino here with our special guests, uh, Los Carlos Medina from the Morning Extra. And, you know, right before the break, we were talking about, um, you know, with the, what happened with Bud Light, it was a case of, hey, don't market to me that way. I think that was one of your comments. And I, and I saw that personally, you know, with uh, places that we frequent and uh, both from, you know, the, the bar, uh, I guess, goers, as well as even some of the owners eventually just saying, hey, wait a second, pull all uh, the Bud Light from the taps. You know, we have people who uh, don't, don't want to see it or sitting on the bar. Well, it's, be, it's become, and, and I find this to be very strange because I could walk into any bar and just be like, give me Bud Light, give me a Miller Light, yeah. Coors Light. I, was, and I, I didn't have brand loyalty. I just said, give me one of yeah. these three light beers. Yeah. I now find that if you tell me, here's my only option, like in a hotel room, hotel lobby in Orlando, the only light beer they had was Bud Light. I was like, listen, I will pay the extra 12 bucks to have a vodka Sprite rather than be seen with that thing. And, and so you have to realize, how badly do you have to mismarket a product to where the connotation among men is, if you're drinking that, you're not in the club anymore. Yeah, and I think it was it was misunderstood by a lot of people. Like, this is not a patriotic American thing because the no. number one beer in the world is Modelo now, which yeah. is literally Mexican. And ironically, in the rest of the world, both companies are owned by InBev. It was spun yeah. off here as part of their merger, so they couldn't be here. So it's not a patriotic American thing. It can't no. be. It is a, you offended me 
and what I believe in on a I personal don't want to be associated a, with it. And that's much harder to come back from. Yeah. A, if it is just a, oh, you know what? We, we, we dissed America. You can go the other way. But what they didn't realize is they pissed off people on an individual level, which I think is a lot harder to come back from. And, and I think the other side of it, too, is thinking back through their sales process. OK, so I mentioned at restaurants and bars and, uh, you know, we've had owners pull it away. But I think, you know, that's an environment where people see what you're drinking. Yep. I'm not saying that, look, their sales are still, you know, out there. People will buy it, take it, drink it in their home maybe. But, you know, a good portion of their sales are out in public. All right. And so how, you know, how is that faring? And I, I just know from my own personal experience, that's that's tanking. It's part of the reason they've seen their sales drop off. Yeah, I think people, I look, trend trends were changing anyway. Yeah. The craft beer revolution, it, it eventually, it's going to funnel its way down to everybody, right? There were people who were going into a bar on a Thursday night by mm-hmm. themselves drinking six Budweiser's, right? Yeah. What do you think happens when you have your first craft beer, your first delicious, made for you out of a tap craft beer? And it's not offense to it. It's craft no. beer is made without the preservative. What, what do you think happens? Do you think for the first time ever, like, why the hell have I been drinking, drinking this? this? I think there's something to do with that too. That trend, it just sped up a trend that was already but, happening. But there is a there is a cost conscious buyer who yes. decides that if you're telling me that this craft beer is going to be at, at, at five bucks and this other beer is going to be three bucks, they're going to say, okay, well, which are the three dollar beers? I'll take one of those sure. three. And if if the three dollar beers are Miller Lite, Coors Light, Bud Light, but this one has this a stigma attached to it. They go with the other one. So I and I'm with you. I would sooner drink because I'm I'm not a big beer drinker. I will like yeah. to grab like one craft beer, two craft beers for dinner. That's what I'm gonna do. But if you're telling me you're going to be that guy who's just getting off of work, just put in his twelve hours and the difference is yeah. six a six dollar beer versus three dollar beer, you might say that's what I'm gonna but do. Th- you're also maybe trying something for the first time because you were so set in your ways. It's a competitive marketplace. It's not like this happened where somewhere where there's only two competitors and you're between one and the other in yeah. some kind of monopoly. But but so in many bars that's the case though. When, when, in, right. ter- in terms of pricing. In terms of that yes, particular person who's making a, a determination on price. Right. Yeah. And then the smart competitors would have adjusted that plan really quickly, lowered their price to capitalize yep. on that if they were smart. But again, that is a complicated system. Yeah. The three-tier system in this country, to get it from the distributor, from the manufacturer to the distributor to the bar, is much more complicated than people know. It's not yeah. as easy. Yeah, it's, it's a simple chain. There yeah. are laws also all over the place. Like in Georgia, yeah. you are not allowed to advertise the price of anything. No. If you yeah. do, it has to be, we, it's $3 all the time. That's why happy hours don't exist right. here, which sucks, by the way. Florida's <laughs> really good about this. <laughs> the fact that they have different hours of pricing, I'm like, this is... This is a little uh, miracle area well, You here. want to talk about being woke? That was the other thing that pissed me off uh, at the end of ladies' night. Like, wait a second. You're going to stop <laughs> doing uh, ladies' night? I, Literally, the only reason that guys show up is because they know it's ladies' night. Like, it ends up turning up being all dudes anyway. Yeah. Yep. Why are we getting rid of something that has the fake name? <laughs> Keep going, Trump. All right. Get so us let, back let, on let, track here. About, no, so we talked about data. Now, obviously, we've got lows here. So let's dive in a little bit. So, um, you know, what type of data do you think they were looking at to make these decisions? Because, I mean, I, I'll get into some of the things, the fails I've seen over time. But, um, you know, if this was a data-driven decision, you mentioned you saw, you know, kind of the, the team, uh, the Anheuser-Busch team. What, do you, what did you hear? What did you see that they seem to think that, uh, you know, they should be going in this direction? This is the problem. I don't believe this was data-driven. I believe this was feelings-driven. This yeah. is what was a... If, at times, and we all, if, if, you're, if you're doing any kind of smart marketing, you're always going to be saying things on location. So here's the trend analysis. Here's the information. Here's where things are going. Let's try and decide how we can take advantage of it uh, and best capture that audience. I think they looked at it and it was more of a, of a feeling thing of what if we do this? What if it garners us a certain amount of attention and it drives people to come try our product or to look at our product differently? And it did. You know, and that's the problem. It's that sometimes there can be an up, opposite side of that pancake. Yeah, you know, well, and that's I mean, I think that's the problem with people who try to follow influencers and likes and they think that, you know, awareness is always going to be good. Awareness, as we've yeah. talked about, isn't always always positive. Yeah. And I think that when you're on the creative side and this was a creative play, that there's more emotion that goes into it. You're right, Lois. I think what they didn't Bennett think was they think the targeting is so good that it'll only be targeted to the people that want to see that message. Right. Not realizing right. how quickly social media goes outward and it expanded. Because if you think about it, you're talking about point zero zero one percent of their global I mean it is it is nothing. This was right. an experiment. This was not a campaign. This was a trial that spread so far behind their wildest beliefs because they believe that that targeting is there and that data is accurate. And I'll tell you from someone who sees the back end, it is not as accurate as we believe it to be. There's right. no magic bullet so you can only make sure the people who want to see that message see it. It doesn't and it won't exist. So I think they miss that's another thing that they miss they miss thought through. Yeah. Well they were hoping for having that moment where suddenly it catches fire and it grabs them all's attention and everyone goes like whoa good for Bud Light. That was not the reaction of their core consumer. And and the fact that, you're, as you're saying, you just marketed to a small amount. We did an Instagram video, and it's 10, 15 seconds, and here's what they're doing. 
And that was enough to spread everywhere where everybody saw it, talked about it, made their decisions on buying. Do you think that AB got scapegoated? Do you think that this movement would have happened to somebody else and because it was AB, it was amplified that much? I think anybody who went down this type of road, because we've now seen this with another uh, different companies, depending on, and again, Bud Light jumped in a way yeah. where I went. That's that's pretty hardcore when you're using the person you decide to use. When you scale it back, it doesn't seem like the the backlash, if it does happen, is anywhere near as strong. Like, I don't think anybody, when you start to have Pride Month, takes any kind of issue with saying, here's what we're doing, here's our marketing, and we're inclusive of the community. Nobody then makes a decision to say, I'm not going to buy that anymore. But if you tell me, I'm trying to market to your son a bathing suit that'll hide his junk. Okay, now that's a little bit different. That's yeah. a, like, right. that's why I say that personal. it makes it more pride, personal. Pride is I mean, not personal. It doesn't affect you. It's going yeah. on, and you're either hey, but no matter what, you're like this is happening, right? When it affects your own individual child and your family, oh. I think that is one time you are allowed to get angry. And I and I think part of Bud Light's longer term problems um, of people kind of weren't sure where they stood, where, what what it was about. I mean, it was. Obviously, it's an alcohol brand, but we talked about the seltzer issues. They've kind of morphed over time. They've been too big to fail. Um, I don't think that they had a clear core and a clear conscience, and I think that may have set them up for the backlash as well. Yeah, and and I think this is a great topic of conversation. The only problem with that is Miller Lite is going through the same problems right now. Coors Light has gone through the same problems. So much merger, acquisition, they've all been going downhill. I think that's where someone like Modelo was able to come. Modelo had that brand for the brave. For They had that brand. And all of a sudden, AB starts letting go of their sponsorships and Modelo just starts snapping them up. And now all of a sudden, you're associating Modelo with the NFL and sports games and college football. So I think, yes, that is, but but I think that was an industry-wide problem that you needed someone smart a smart marketer to emerge, right. and I don't think that any of those guys were positioned to do no, so. No, and I think if you if you go back, what, four years now, five years uh, to the Nike, you know, um, incident, I think Nike stood their ground, right? Nike felt that they were for the athletes and for the choice, uh, whether whichever side you fall on the whole um, decision we're talking, there. Are talking Kaepernick? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, could I just have to start this out there? Los, you may or may not agree with me. I've looked at the numbers. He was not a good quarterback. Yeah. That is the pro- that is my yeah. problem. I mean, I've I've heard and I've gotten to arguments with people like, but 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 I've looked at the actual numbers and by numbers, he was a average, mediocre, at best quarterback that didn't deserve to be starting in this situation. I thought Nike did a really good job of as this was occurring, they found a way to give him space to say, "You're wearing Che shirts, okay? You're talking right. about things that are decidedly un-American." But we're not going like we're going to support you to say it, but we're not going to associate ourselves brand wise to you because they stood with what their core was. Right. Right. And it was about the athlete. It was about the performance. And it was, to your point, talking about diversity, talking about but not. We're not going to do it on our Not on our behalf. Yeah, they weren't right? going to make an entire line of, of Kaepernick stuff. They were just going to say, we support the right of the athlete to have an opinion, say what, even if it's wildly un American or against everything in the NFL. And they just said, but that's not our brand. That's not right. our marketing. But they knew who their brand was. Yes. And I think, so, you know, we've seen some of these things, but they were, I mean, look, Nike today is is still killing it, right? Obviously, there were some, maybe some uh, bumps in the road that uh, happened. But I think that's where, um, you know, Anheuser-Busch has, has failed. We don't know really who they are. No, and I think a lot of times, too, you do have the push and, and – to, to pull back the curtain a little bit, so my wife works for a major company. They do a lot of consulting work, and one of the things that all of her clients are constantly talking about now is their ESG score yeah. and how they're perceived in the marketplace on what they're doing. And so there's there's a point where every company out there is wanting to market to say, hey, we want to make sure we're in good standing here. At the time, you're trying to also make sure that you just don't violate that lane of suddenly making, wow, my entire marketing plan and how I'm viewed is now just viewed within this this realm. Well, and it's it's the same thing. So obviously, that's one of the spaces that, that I'm in now at ResourceWise. And so what we've seen, and, and there have been a couple of companies recently that have pulled back in the entire carbon credit game. Yeah. Because uh, Vera and a few others, the, the carbon credits have been deemed... They're false, right? Right. They really were not, uh, you know, created the way that uh, they sold them to be created. And so now all of a sudden companies are going, wait a second, we don't want to be associated with something that's not really protecting. Something can be a little fraudulent. Right, yes. okay, because yeah. we're already not doing anything. We're buying these offsets as a way to show our goodwill. Right. So now we've, we're seeing companies, and, and Nestle was one of the first that just said, hey, we're not going to be in the uh, credit game. We're totally everything we're going to do, and we've got goals. 
but it's going to be about what we truly do ourselves and not we're not going to buy our way yeah, into and, and sustainability. It's, it's such a good point. I think a lot of these places come from a place of good intention. Right. right? I think carbon credits, carbon off, they come from places of good intention. It is just the bureaucracy of this country that we can have the best intentions of the world. They could be written the right way. It is manipulated to a point where this, I think that's one of the things, I think that team of people believed they were doing service to Bud Light, that this was a, yeah. this, they had a good intention to what they were doing, misguided, uh, uh, misguided. You hit it right misguided, there. Misguided, but they believed that they had positive intentions. It is crazy how quickly, and my, my just say we screwed up. But Just say it. But you just said it, and we talked about it when we started this conversation. We talked about the data versus your feelings. You just said it. They had good intentions. Hence. Intentions isn't data. Intention isn't information. And intentions isn't a course. I'll go back to my Kimberly Clark days when I started and then I was leading uh, our, you know, our marketing team. We, for every brand, much like, you know, Bud, Bud Light, Michelob, et cetera, we had a brand sheet. Who was the audience? What was the core? What were keywords, messages, users, all the way through? We would do experiments. We would go do experiential marketing, maybe sure. at a, you know, some type of event that wasn't our core audience. Sure. We would do and, advertising. And Commodity. Commodity. Similar. Kimberly Clark, and it's similar, more people similar to Bud Light. But any time we and, did it and it was something that it was outside the core, it was to come back to, wait a second, let's go back to our brand mm -hmm. strategy, our brand document. Are we 180 degrees from that? Right. And we actually, we did some print advertising where we had tattooed guys. This is 25 years ago, you know, and you had all the, you know, the look like a biker guy tattooed. And we got a few pushbacks because there were some people looking at some of the tattoos in there and saying, well, I, I think that is X, Y, and Z. You know, and it's, but it's one of those things you've got to, you know, are you going against your core um, or do you even understand your core? And I, I think that's part of where they, they just lost it. Yeah, so, I mean, the game is always, I, I have my core, I want to expand everything moving forward. Yeah. But it's just, you got, there's got to be a level of, of, of being careful about understanding that cause and effect issue when it comes to Completely your core agree. versus who else you're bringing in. Like most things in business, there's ebbs and the flows, time. but you got to come back to your middle line, which is your average median right. line. Now, let's let's talk a little bit about this. So what did we learn from this? And what advice do we give to brands moving forward to not be in this situation? And, and you know, let's we can be as top line as we want here. Like, know your brand. We understand right. that. But, like, I think your damage control is important. Oh. I think how you admit, and I think one of the problems, and I'm not going to blame Trump for this, but there are a lot of people now that just – don't want to admit they did anything wrong. And I think this is really what pissed people off. No the, one came out and said, we screw up. We alienated our people. We are sorry. They, that, those words did not come out of their mouth. 98.7% correct. And that's is that, what they is that did. the temperature of people's body? Did <laughs> yeah, you do that on exactly. I did it on purpose because they are basically you that just leveled they, they alienated 98.7% of the people because they didn't take it back and then they tried to distance themselves both. So there was a, a small percent of people that weren't offended, but they basically offended both sides by not, you know, being strong to whatever side or whatever point they wanted to. Yeah, make. because now all of a sudden the people that you were trying to advertise to now they're pissed because you pulled back your mention because you yeah. were bullied into doing it. That, so there's no there's no middle except the rational people. And honestly, I'm not saying I'm a rational person, but I was really like, can we just stop talking about this? Like yeah. I was so over it. And you know what? I'm not drinking Bud Light because it's terrible beer anyway. <laughs> well, there's a there's an element here when you talk about that experimental marketing. What what are we yeah. going to try? What are we going to do to grow? understand and this is to every marketing person out there because of the way all of this is integrated your messaging from television to radio to print to digital eventually all has to kind of be along the same lines because one of them might explode on you the time that you tried to put this particular radio ad and that's the one that everyone grabs and goes can you believe what they put on the radio in this marketplace when you decide to use instagram and you decide to do 20 seconds i want to point this out Instagram might as well be cable television, might as well be Fox. It will find itself out there. There's no self-destruct button. There anymore, is, like said, there's there, no, there. This, this message will explode. Yes. It is, it is, It'll it, be it out is there. And so you have to have that uniformity. If yeah. you're comfortable putting it on TV, understand. Be comfortable putting the rest of it out there. No, this message has to be solid across the board. Yeah, and yeah. which is also a big problem in marketing because once you do that, you're so concrete of what you can do that you don't take any risks and you don't venture and you become monotonous and robotic. But so, you're concrete. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, ultimately, yeah. listen, I'm, I'm safe by nature at times, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm ex experimental yeah. here. Here and there, but I'm like, I'm gonna be concrete. That's a very hard yeah. way to grow.
is to be just straight down the middle and consistent. And now, you well, know, some tarts, some tarts, why do you want to grow? You're the largest beer in the world. You're, you're, you're at this point. Do you need to grow more? And sometimes it's greed that makes you want to do that. But if you, you, I agree with you that there but, are times. But if you do not have a plan to, if you're not venturing a little bit away from that middle, you will not grow at the rate in which corporate America makes you want to grow. Well, to but, grow, you, there's two pieces. And we always, people forget this sometimes. It is, can you grow the size of the pie? All right. So can they grow their, you know, the overall non-craft beer category or can you grow your slice of the pie? And I think a lot of times people only think about growing the, their slice of the pie. Well, and that's, that's sometimes a problem. Here's where I look at it. And you talk about growth. I think growth comes from spotting the trends and yeah. being able to jump in on it and, and capitalize on that trend. As we talked about before, Bud Light didn't see the seltzer trend at the time and they were yeah. well behind on it. And so they could have rode that wave in and gotten right. their numbers and then it just moved on. Whether it happens to be Who's the next country music star? Who's the next whatever? Who would spot that trend and take advantage of it? It's not going to come from taking a grown man who's trying to be a nine-year-old girl and trying to sell to your people. You have to spot the trends differently. And I'm saying yeah. be solid within spotting the trends and being smart about when to go. Yeah. yeah. And, and don't be cute. I mean, I think that's part of the, you know. And, and, be solid. Yeah. I like solid. You know, I think people try to, uh, you know, figure out, oh, this is something, yeah, they'll get attention and, and go from there. And I think that's uh, yeah. a problem. You know, one of the... The other ones I'll throw out there is understand the difference between your brand and your logo, right? And, oh, that's, and such a hard, that's such a hard one, though. Nike, the brand is the logo. There, I mean, there, there are certain companies but, that are just so synonymous with that thing. And I think, but, but there are others is, that have done it, and you know, you get an uproar, and you, but they really understand their brand and what they're about. Yeah. And you know, it's not it's not the advertising or the logo. And I say logo. I mean, we can use Dunkin' and Dunkin' Donuts as an example. That's a true logo change that really became successful, right? Because they didn't change the brand. Yes, they changed the name and the logo. But then there's others who will go out there and they'll do advertising and other things and essentially change that feeling of the brand and that's where they run into run afoul yeah, of their I agree. customers. I agree. I think this is a good example of like that's this role of the CMO and the fact that the yeah. CMO didn't green like this or wasn't that one who tied it together. Or you know what? Bud Light probably has 14 agencies and one oh. of the agencies went rogue with this and there were no checks and balances. <laughs> and I ultimately, it is part of the diminished role of the CMO that, that that's supposed to be their job. And they're supposed to be the ones that take responsibility. It, it, I agree with you. You know what? We are in an industry, yeah. and I see it in a lot of industries. Automotive is the worst. It is so female dominated when you are going after men as your target audience. And I'm not saying that that's wrong i'm just saying that that is counterintuitive so but when they took that lady and that group of people and said they're the problem the only thing i know about business is that you let your team celebrate your failures and you celebrate no you take you let your team celebrate the, the wins and, and you, you take celebrate the failures. the failures oh absolutely so where was that leadership and i think from the business sense that's what pissed people off well, there was I, no one there i'm gonna tell you guarantee from here on out that cmo is going to see every bit of content oh, that's right. going across and saying we cannot allow ourselves to ever be in this situation ever again to lose this kind of market share yeah, and I think that they are going to have a very, very, very hard time getting it back. And I think they're going to have to do one of two things, like you said, the world's hardest pivot or the world's slowest slowest growth trajectory to get back to where they were because I don't think they will ever see those days. Ever oh, I, I can I can fix yeah. it. You just need boobs, okay? That's all we got to do. It's just back to swimming pools oh. and boobs and dogs, okay? And by the way, so in America, America. That, that works. Right, so you I don't care what? what anyone says. That works. That's, well. And it's interesting because this week, I don't and know if dudes. you saw. Just throw a couple yeah, dudes in there. Dudes just throw a couple dudes in there. Everybody have a good so, time. Everyone has a good time. So let's yeah. use another real-life example that happened this week, all right? Um, Victoria's Secret has been cratering for two years, right? They right. made the decision, nothing against them, but they made the decision that, um, hey, we're going to go completely different. We're going to get rid of the angels. No more angels. That's not our... All right, they've now announced they're bringing back, I think they're calling it uh, Vintage Angels or something like that. They're bringing at least two uh, two of them back in order to try to get back their audience. But again, different... Victoria's Secret got destroyed because people aren't going to malls anymore and they had no e-commerce and they had so many competitors that came in that were talking about comfort right. and like... But the question is, did they get away from their brand? Was it the pandemic or, um, I think they took or something too, else. They took too long to react, and by the time they did react, it had to be such a hard pivot, which right. you'll never come back from. It's the same thing. If you were out ahead of trends, like, like Lo said, if you were out ahead of trends, you have the ability to be in the driver's seat. If you wait to react right. and wait too long, then your reaction is too hard, and you, you, you need yeah. jerk the other way. Well, that, that's my, my view of this. Okay, so now they're going back. I'm not saying they shouldn't have cut back on the angels and had a more a broader uh, advertising and marketing push. Than they did when it was all angels, right? But they went from all to nothing. None. Yeah. 
And now and, they're realizing, uh oh, we've got a problem. Now we're going back. And, well, and, and I think how many me, women do you think? Problem. How many women do you think watch the Victoria's Secret fashion show? So many women. It right. wasn't just dudes yeah. oogling these people. It was a cultural thing. Right. That's when you get into big problems. When you start cutting out these cultural things because you feel like you're offending people. Look, everyone's going to be pissed off at something. It's not everyone is going to find something to be pissed off at. The biggest advantage that anybody has in this world is when you're a beautiful woman, a woman or a rich man. Okay, those are yeah. two. No matter what, you're always going to have the biggest advantage. And what Victoria's Secret was selling you was that this is nice lingerie that you can afford that will make your wife, your girlfriend look this way. And by the way, lady, it's also going to enhance who you are. And to go away from that marketing plan, just that 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 is what Victoria's Secret yeah. says. And, and by the way, it's not weird when I walk into one of those stores, I'm going to get help and I'm going to be able to do And that was that was all part of it. Now yeah. you are selling this vision, yep. right, of what you wanted. You know this experience. I'm a rich this man, and she's a beautiful woman. You know the irony of that, right? That that lingerie that you're talking about that was probably three percent of their sales. They yeah. had oh. their company. Yeah. Concept, they had. They, they had they all. Didn't, the... They didn't lean into that. They didn't nope. lean into the comfort. It was that be this person. Yeah, and right. that's what pissed people off. Which there's a way to walk that line. You can be very balanced. Hey, it's also comfortable. There's right. a way to do that. They just the did pink, not do it. Right. They I mean, that was a huge part of it. And I'll tell you, I think we know way too much about women's laundry. Yeah. I, will, I will tell you, there's a there's a line, and I encourage uh, any one of you gentlemen to look into this. There's an, an online line called Adore Me. And it's the yeah. same concept of, of making your wife, your girlfriend look beautiful. She gets, they send her stuff over, very similar to some of the other uh, services out there, uh, un underwear, everything yeah. else, and she gets to try it on. And that has really jumped into that spot that you had in Tori's Secret Lose. They are, they are still celebrating the fact that your wife, your girlfriend looks beautiful in this attire and make sure you she keeps holding on to her buying more of it. And I bet you Victoria's Secret had that threat in mind when they made their misguided yeah. pivots. Exactly. No, I think uh, that's definitely a, a key area. So, hey, when we come back from the break, um, let's go in a little bit, um, you know, talking about how, you know, how we see this divide happening and how we stop some of that. All right. Yeah. So you're listening to the Marketing Man Men on Extra 106.3. We'll be right back. This morning in the Atlanta airport, no one's missing a meal on Mac Wilburn's watch. With 11 restaurants to serve passengers, he's got dining for every destination. And it all started when Mac talked with First Horizon Bank about opening a franchise in the airport. Now it's open for business and cleared for takeoff. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Mac. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Now back to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3 FM. Welcome back to the Marketing Mad Men. Trip Job and Nick Constantino here with uh, Carlos Medina from The Morning Extra. Um, you know, we were talking uh, right before the break. Uh, obviously, we've gone through a lot of examples of brands that have gone wayward. Um, and, you know, obviously, your your time on The Morning Extra, obviously talking about politics and, and what it's, you know, the, I guess the American culture and how we think about things. So, do you see that as continuing to influence decisions that brands and companies are making out there? And, and you know, well, let's just start there. What, what are you seeing and how do you think that's going to continue rolling here, you know, the rest of this year and next year being an election year? Part of it is cultural. Part of it is when people see that they can have an influence over brands, they'll, they'll use their, their dollar to do so. Part of that is economic. And I know we can talk about where things are in this country and when. You are in an inflationary environment. You are in an environment where people are concerned about the economy. It makes it very easy for them to start making certain brand choices based off of their their own feelings, where they mm -hmm. say, I've bought this for years, but now suddenly I don't quite have my dollar going as far, and they upset me. You know, there's certain brands where you could tell me, for instance, if, if there was an Apple product that suddenly Apple believed in, I don't know, aliens, whatever. Yeah. I'm still going to buy it because I'm like, this is still the best product and it's still going to cost me what it's going to cost me. But when it's a, a, you know, whether it's how inelastic or elastic the good is, I'm going to make a decision because suddenly my dollar's not going quite as far and maybe I don't believe with them politically. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's that's the case of understanding. Are you in a, a product category that can't, there are readily available substitutes? Sure. Right. And obviously everything we talked about with uh, both on the beer side, lingerie side, et cetera. But you can, you can get away with right now. Writing that line of, of I'm socially responsible, yet I'm not political. And I think that's where right. the success is right now. For everybody involved, of, of market to me, don't preach to me. Right. And I think those are two different things. Yeah. And I think there's there's some brands out there who've done a pretty good job of that. Um, you know, I think uh, obviously 
Apple's out there a little bit. Um, what are some other ones you would think about that uh, are maybe? I'll, I'll go back to the beer category. Yeah. I think Yingling has been very smart of saying yep. we are American. We are now the longest mm-hmm. uh, American brewery. This is what we are. Pottsville, mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, heart of America. Yeah. Here's who we are. And people go, all right, I'm going to buy Yingling. I, mm-hmm. I tried. They have a, a new one called Flight. I didn't have any idea about this yep. until I went to a concert. And for the first time I tried Flight there, it's like their ultra light beards. It's, it's their category of trying to give you a, a healthy option. And I went, it's not great, but you know what? It's not Bud Light. Yeah. And so, I, so I'm willing to try some stuff and do some stuff. If, if, you're, if you're, again, telling me it's out there, I'll give it a try because you're not telling me what I should be thinking or doing politically. Yeah, I think Ford's done that for years and years. Yeah. Right? You know, Made in America, obviously the F-150, I mean – they know their audience. They don't deviate from that. But when you go to the other brands within Ford, okay, maybe things you know shift a little bit. But it does come back to mostly this is an American car made in America, designed in America, and that's what they're about. And they also did something in recent years that it affected me in the same way. They reached for nostalgia. When they went back to the Ford Bronco, okay, my dad had an 81 Ford Bronco. Like We hunted all up and down through Texas in that Ford Bronco. That was that was his, when he had to get rid of Big Blue and that truck went away, that man had a tear that came out of his eye. And so when the new Broncos came uh, out, I was like, man, I kind of want to get one of those or maybe I want to see if dad wants to buy them. Maybe I'll buy one for dad. Like that, that meant something to me. And so that's where, when you talk about reaching out to people and, and sometimes playing on their, on their, you know, nostalgic nature, that, that right. worked for me when it came for Ford. Yeah. I'll mention two others. I think one that is one that has done a lot more and probably in the last year and a half, I think they started it early last summer. I know they get real big coming up here, like the tennis U S open, but Jersey Mike's. Mm-hmm. So they've gone really big on the day of giving. Right. And it's not just one day of giving now. I think they do it multiple times and they do things and, you know, give them a lot of credit because they don't get they don't preach necessarily about who it's going to or the the view. But it's we're going to give back. We're going to give to local charities, national charities, et cetera. But I think they've done a nice job. I I honestly I don't know what the the data shows as far as their sales, but uh, I think they they're towing that line of, hey, we want to give back, but we're not going to preach about it. And I do like that you have used Danny DeVito as as somebody who you're conscious of being a comedian, somebody funny yeah. for for 40 years in this country because they weren't having Danny DeVito 20 years ago, even no. 15 years ago. Their growth has now gotten to the point where they can put together these commercials all based on they comedy didn't have and their TV food. before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was all based on comedy and the quality of the sandwich. And so, yep. if, if you're doing something else that you're raising money for, I think you can feel good about making a purchase or walking into one of their stores. Yeah, and I think that's that's kind of that add-on that they've done with uh, with that campaign. The other one, obviously local, um, they know who their core is. Like it or not, they're closed on Sunday, but Chick-fil-A. Always works, and that's their... First off, I think services is, is their their quality. That's their right. deal. Like, they're, they're first class, and I think they've been, been really smart, especially when it comes to how they've run their operations it's still the one place where my wife and i can go to any point doesn't matter how long the line is we're going to get a quality product we're going to get something the kids are going to like and we're vegan so yeah. i don't even eat there but yet i'll go sit in line for 15 20 minutes because i know what i'm taking home my, my girls are going to love it uh, and to still then have that core of and our greed ends you know saturday night we, yeah. we're not we're not looking to, to sell anything to you on sunday because that's a core principle of our product yeah no um I think this is great. You know, if I want to wrap it up a little bit and let's get maybe one or two your core ideas, I think it is, you know, to me, it's always going back. Have a core brand principle. I mean, really a written down brand strategy, brand principle about what your brand's about. And then if you're going to try things, you know, whether it's data or other, um, you know, input you get, go back and check against your brand principles. Now, what about you? I, I think about that regularly from somebody who spent 20 years in sports talk radio. And since 2011, I've been predominantly the data guy here in Atlanta because of my, of my educational background. So I would break down salary caps and here's what's going on in some of these markets. And here's why your team can afford this or can't afford it and make that make sense to the listener. By the time I moved over to politics, I realized we're changing the brand here a bit. But what I wanted to make sure the core was is that I'm never going to come on the air and be uninformed. And so right. I'm going to do the prep work on the sports side. I'm going to give you this information. And all I did was move it and say, it's not going to be sports as much. It's going to be politics, but the work yeah. behind it, that's that's the core part of the brand for me. And so I think that if if you do transition, make sure that a core element of your brand, if you try something new, is still there and recognizable. Right. And, you know, do you think that um, 
some of the brands out there today believe that their audiences aren't informed? No, I, I think that you have to just you have to be cognizant of that. If your audience isn't informed, it doesn't take much for them to be informed right. and then to start spreading the message of something they don't like. And so you can operate under, hey, they don't know any better. It's fine. What is that uh, from from Tommy Boy? You know, he doesn't know any better. <laughs> it's like, I'm the American. Yeah. He doesn't know any better. Yeah. Well, now they do know better because it doesn't take much for them to find out really quickly. Right. And so yeah. I'd like to imagine that your, your, your audience member, your person who purchases your product, your customer – you might be able to get away with the fact that they know or they don't know, but if they don't like it, they'll all find out really quick. Right. And I think that's where you have to be careful. We've talked about it at times that, you know, this unofficial research sometimes, you know, someone hears, oh, my spouse recommended this or, you know, I overheard someone, uh, you know, at the uh, food court at the mall. You know, those type of things are the ones we really have to be careful about. Okay, there are reasons to dive in and get more data, but that can't be your, your primary reason to make a major shift. I would hope that, because that's all anecdotal is what right. it comes down to, but I would hope that anecdotal might lead you to go, well, let me do a little bit more looking into this, because that might be something where your brand is perceived a certain way, good or bad. You might yeah. be saying, why are we not perceived in the way we believe uh, to a level of quality? Again, it might be anecdotal, but it might cause you to start looking and do some real research. Yeah, no, we don't, we don't have enough time, but yeah, I could go into a few few ideas and few examples uh, back in the day of people saying, hey, we ought to do this. Pinterest is one of them. And, you know, you start looking at the data and it's like, uh, no, this is like 3% <laughs> of the population. So anyway, um, fantastic discussion, Lois. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, uh, no, thank you guys. I was yeah. looking forward to it. Every single time I hear the ads, I hear the show on the weekend, when are they going to call me? When am I yeah. going to get asked around here? <laughs> hey, you know what? Guess what? We won't wait till we need to have another angry topic. That sounds topic. good, yes. Yeah, well, no, we'll bring you back again. Sounds so good. That's awesome. So you've been listening to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3. Tonight in Arkansas, there's a mother tucking in her daughter and turning off the light. A business owner is burning the midnight oil. An at-home dinner date is plating up possibility. And it's all happening under one roof. How? The power of a conversation. Like the one John from Integrity Solutions had with First Horizon Bank about his vision for a sustainable mixed-use building. Now it's not just words, it's life. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC.